Hello and welcome to the Pinal Geology Museum and Geology, Geology and Mineral Society meeting and presentation for March, April 20th, 2022. We're just starting a minute late here. I apologize for that. I uh, see we have some visitors already. I want to make a couple of uh, quick announcements uh, before, before things get going. Um, first of all, we are going to have summer hours. For the first time ever, the Pinal Geology and Mineral Museum is going to be open Fridays, June, July, and August. So yay that. Uh, we're also looking for volunteers, not just for those Fridays, but for those Fridays and for any other day. So please contact us. The email is at the bottom, or you contact us through the website, penalgeologymuseum.org, and we will be happy to set you up uh, as a volunteer. You can come skilled. You don't have to have skills. We got stuff like paper shoveling. Uh, we got stuff like painting. You know, paint, just do this. So who knows what we have. We'll have those, those uh, open days. We'll also be work days um, this summer, and we have air conditioning. So please come. Um, we've got a couple of new exhibits at the museum and encourage you to come in, even if you've come in before. And that's about it. So tonight I'm going to start our, add our speaker to the stream here and he's going to, oh yes. And the next meeting is April, May, May 18th. Some days I get it right. Speaker to be announced. All right. So this is Mr. Mark Hay, and he has been a collector for uh, since the 70s, almost as long as I have. Of course, I didn't do anything with it. He's also a former mining engineer, and he has worked in several places around the country and collected around the country. So this is Mark, and he's going to talk to us about vanadite. Uh, I'm no, I never pronounced that right. Uh, field collecting in the Western Arizona. So I will let you take it away, Mark, and I'll start your slideshow when you're ready. All right, Bob, whenever you're set to go, I'm here. Okay. There's your slideshow up and going. Now to start with, Bob, did you say I was a mining engineer? I said forming, former. Uh, no, no, no. I'm oh. a mine, I was a mine geologist. Me and mine geologist. Okay, I heard wrong. Remembered yeah, that, wrong. One there, of them. There's, there's big difference. There's a lot of conflict <laughs> between engineers and geologists, so I don't my want to start off on the wrong foot. My apologies to both groups. <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, I started collecting back in the 1970s, and when I first, uh, um, my first job out of college, I went to ASU, and my first job, or, or just almost the first, I did have a little six-month spot, but was at the Magma Mine in Superior, an underground hard rock copper mine. And while I was there, I got hooked on collecting minerals. I met a couple of very uh, passionate mineral collectors, Reg Barnes and Les Presmick, and they both hooked me in like a, uh, a fish being landed on the, the uh, deck of a boat. And I loved it. I've enjoyed it ever since. But so that was in the late 1970s. And one of my favorite minerals was vanadinite. And it's, you know, it's easy to see why. I mean, vanadinite's beautiful. The colors are stunning, lustrous crystals. And Arizona is one of the best localities in the country for vanadinite. And in fact, I think it's pretty clear it is the best. Um, Specimens like these two at that time were the classic Arizona vanadinite localities. The one on the left is Apache, which is up by Globe, Miami. And the one on the right is Old Yuma, which is just outside of Tucson in the uh, Tucson Mountains. And these were both collected um, by people that I knew back at that time. The one on the left, the Apache, was collected by um, Phoenix collector Tom McKee and Bob Jones, those guys were together on that trip. And the one on the right was collected by Tucson collector Al Haig in the, uh, 
in the in the uh, mid 1950s. Well, advance a couple of years into the early 1980s, and I really got the bug to want to go collecting, field collecting. Well, these localities were both off limits. Um, both of them at that time, and for many years back then, were held by interests that were collecting minerals for commercial purposes. So they weren't going to let somebody like me in on a weekend to come in and dig. Uh, so if I was going to be collecting vanadinite, I was going to have to find somewhere else to go. So the uh, for people that go out and do field digging, you know that you need to do need to find a spot to go. It needs to be something that you can access. Uh, it's easier said than done, because if it was already out there, then people would be digging it. So to find something that is little known or not known is a challenge. So this specimen was the first one to take me into the Benadonite field collecting uh, world. I acquired this at the Tucson show in 1983 or 1984 from Tucson dealer Gene Schlepp. It's a, it, it's a pretty cool piece. It's about three inches across. You can see it's got these uh, matte luster green crystals. I had never really seen green vanadinite before, but Gene did not know the mine it came from. He had it labeled as Castle Dome Mountains. Uh, the Castle Dome District has got a lot of mines down there. If you've ever looked at the topo map, it looks like somebody stood back and blasted it with a shotgun. There are just buying symbols everywhere. I asked Gene if he had any more information and he said he thought it was collected in the late fifties, but he really wasn't sure and he didn't have a mine name. So I took it home and I showed it to my, my, uh, my collecting friends. And like I said, some of them were very experienced and knowledgeable uh, Arizona collectors, and uh, but nobody recognized it. Nobody could tell me anything about it. So it wasn't until a couple of months later that I had the opportunity to show it to Wayne Thompson in Phoenix. And those of you that know Wayne know that he is a veritable encyclopedia of mineral knowledge. He never forgets a mineral that he's seen. And anyway, when I showed it to Wayne, Wayne said, oh yeah, I know that piece. He said, that's an old puzzler mine piece. And I had never heard that before. So the way you spell it is P-U-Z-Z-L-E-R. Well, pretty unique. And you know, anytime I would have heard that, I would have remembered it. So anyway, that sent me off looking at uh, mining reports. So US Geological Survey, uh, U.S. and Arizona Bureau of Mines, but we found nothing. Um, my good friend, Dick Morris, who did a lot of digging with me, uh, he helped me look and, and we came up empty handed. So uh, we put it away. Oh, let me mention one other thing. We did take one other, one other trip and that was important. We went down to the Department of Mines and Mineral Resources in Phoenix, down by the Capitol, and we met with Niall uh, Nemeth and uh, Diane Bain, both of which have been in the department for years and years, very experienced. They know the records in the department inside and out, and they didn't have anything. So we were at a dead end. So I took it home and boxed it up, stuck it back in the drawer. And several months later, Dick and I were down at the department talking with Diane about something else. And she said, are you guys still looking for that mine down in the Castle Dome district? And we said, yeah, we are. And she said, hang on just a minute. And she went into the back and returned with a very large rolled up map. And when she undid it, one of their staff members had put together a claim map for the Castle Dome district. A tremendous undertaking. There were there had to be a hundred claims on that thing, and by searching it though, we were able to locate the puzzler uh, claim. The problem was that it was not on a USGS topo map. 
It didn't have roads. It didn't have uh, townships or range or sections. Uh, it was just on a big white piece of like butcher paper. But on looking at it, we did notice these funny little squiggly lines, like what you might see that would indicate a drainage, a little straight line with two dots and another straight line and a couple of dots. So we began to compare with the USGS topographic map, and they were the drainages, the patterns matched up. So with that information, we were able to locate the puzzler claim um, in the district, and then bingo, then that was the key we needed. That gave us what roads we needed to go in on and what to look for to get there. So Dick and I planned a trip uh, with a, uh, another collector that we went with quite a bit back then, in fact, through all of my field collecting, George Godis, and the three of us went. So this is the map of Arizona that shows where the puzzler is located. It's down in central Yuma County um, on the east side of the paved highway between Quartzsite and Yuma. This is a morning shot going into the mountains from the west. So we're looking east. Those are the Castle Dome Mountains. The big prominent uh, butte on the left center is Castle Dome Peak. This dirt road super highway we're looking at here is a federal road. This is across the Yuma Army Proving Ground, which is on both sides of this highway going in. The highway provides access to the uh, Wildlife Preserve and the Castle Dome Mining District back in the mountains. The puzzler is just to the right of the highway and behind some of those first ridges. So this is a shot looking south. We've gotten off the uh, proving grounds and we're on to the small mining roads. This is the puzzler mine site with these small dilapidated old um, buildings, probably from the 1940s, maybe the 50s, hard to tell. They didn't have any roofs on them. There was no head frame, but there was a vertical shaft and it was in amazingly good condition. This is uh, Dick Morris standing next to it and the miners had left and they had chained this flatbed mine car over the top of the the vertical shaft. You can see the round metal wheels on that thing. We were able to push this to the side. There was enough slack in the chains to allow us to squeeze in between the mine car and the timbers around the collar of the shaft. And there was a wonderful ladder inside of it going straight down. Um, the rails on the left there are the, where the muck skips came up when the mine was active. But you can see that ladder looks like it was put in 20 years before. Um, it was definitely pre MSHA though. It goes down 200 feet straight to the bottom. An interesting thing and quite a surprise to me, this was my first real um, field collecting success and field collecting venture was the amount of the Nadenite we found in the mine. The, the uh, shaft was sunk right down the vein, and then periodically down the shaft were drifts, were tunnels that went off in both directions down. Uh, again, they followed the vein, and there was vanadinite everywhere. Um, it was very clear that the potential for getting specimens in a pocket was, was just wonderful in this place. This is a sketch that I made at the time, and it's a vertical cross section through the puzzler. You can see at the top, and I think you can see my computer um, cursor here, the, I hope so, the ground surface at the top, it's got a north arrow, and then vertically down through the shaft, down to the 200 foot bottom. And then you can see these periodic uh, levels that go off in both directions. The chicken scratchings on here are my descriptions of what I felt at the time were the more significant occurrences of minerals. 
Most were benignite, but there was a small area that had some very attractive, the small wolfenites in them. And then we did find some uh, fluorites here and there, but we, considering the amount of fluorite in the Castledome district, we found, we didn't even find a, any, anything that even would qualify as a crummy specimen. Um, I'm gonna talk about three pockets of anadenite that we hit in the puzzler. Uh, and the first one is I have circled in that red spot there on the left side. Uh, that would be to the south end, and it was on about the 100 level. And at the end of that tunnel, there was a small shaft that went down the vein, maybe 20, but probably not that much, maybe 15 or 12 feet. And again, it was sunk in the vein. The walls, both walls of the shaft in the vein were just loaded with vanadinite. But at the very bottom, we found the, some of the best vanadinite we found in the mine. And Dick and I dug a tunnel back to the north, probably 12 feet back that direction. It wasn't very tall, uh, just enough for hands and knees, but we found very nice vanadinite the entire way. So out of that small tunnel, we must have collected 100 or 120 flats of vanadinite. So this is the tunnel that we dug. If you're looking back to the north with some mining, uh, mining tools there on the left. And then that on the right is a picture of Dick lying down in the tunnel, collecting over his head. Uh, a couple of flats with specimens that are wrapped up and getting ready to take them out. And then this specimen is one that I still have in my collection out of that find. Uh, it's about two and a half inches across. Um, you can see it's got small druzy vanadinite coating the matrix, very attractive, a yellow green lustrous. And then it's got these large, sharp greenish brown crystals on it with these uh, uh, orangish terminations. Okay, the next one I'm going to talk about was down on the 180 level, and it was to the north. And this pocket was the largest pocket that we found. Uh, we did find some larger pieces in the, uh, in the puzzler, but not too many. This is a shot of the pocket when we first opened it up. Uh, that zone with the crystals is probably 15 to 20 inches across. This is a close-up, and it shows a piece in the middle with that bare area kind of on the right and we were able to remove that piece intact and it totally filled a Coors beer flat uh, from rib to rib. Uh, this piece had crystals along the edge that were hoppered and they were a milk chocolate brown, a little bit greenish, but pretty much just brown. Um, and the, it, the other thing is they were pushing a half inch. So these were the biggest crystals that, that my group, Dick and George and I ever found uh, in the puzzler. That large piece we sold, we, that, George Gotis bought that from Dick and I at the surface of the mine. We didn't even get it in the car before he had bought it from us. I was always sad because it had the biggest crystals we found and, and I never found any bit that size later. I have no idea where it went, but I did keep this piece. Um, at the time I was collecting miniatures. So this one's about an inch and three quarters left and left to right. You can see the milk chocolate coloration on the vanadinites. And then interestingly, uh, if you look close, there's a crystal. And again, I hope you can see my cursor. This crystal right here in the center and a little bit right of center has small hexagonal crystals epitaxially growing at the corners of the larger crystals. And a lot of them had them. There's some up here on the edge of these crystals showing along the edge. This was the only pocket that I saw that characteristics in. So now the last um, pocket find that I'm gonna talk about at the puzzler was on the same level down at the 180 and to the um, south end um, in the ceiling on New Year's Day of 1988, Dick and I hit a very nice pocket that uh, we call the green pocket, the green pocket, the brown pocket. Uh, we didn't have much imagination, but you can see why we named them those. 
uh, the green pocket had these olive green rounded stacks of lustrous crystals uh, that looked for all the world like pyromorphite. And you can see, but I did have them tested. They were vanadinite. And then there's a little hole pocket in the center with some white blades. And then in the lower left, there's some white blades. Those were barite. And in the bottom uh, layer, bottom level of the mine, we did hit some barites. I didn't see any more shallow. And we didn't find anything else down here. We didn't find the scoloisite or matramite. We did find the wolfenites. That was pretty cool. But And then this specimen is out of the same pocket. You can see the same general characteristics of the crystal form, um, but a little bit lighter green in color. A couple of years later, George Godis went back and he dug in the floor below that pocket and he found some very large barite crystals. Uh, this one is pushing three inches and it's you can see it's coated with druzy vanadinite. Very attractive. He didn't get a lot of these, probably a dozen of them, 15, something like that. And then I did mention that there we had found some wolfenites in there. The, uh, they weren't very big. This is a thumbnail piece, but you can see they're lustrous, they're thick, beveled, very attractive wolfenite. And these came out of the shaft, probably down around the 160, the 150, somewhere like that. Okay, now we're going to leave the puzzler, and I'm going to talk about the Ramsey mine. The Ramsey is in La Paz County, in the Plamosa Mountains, just south of Interstate 10 and several miles east of Quartzite. Now, when, you, when you're out doing reconnaissance for a new mine, and I know a lot of you guys have done digging, but you know, you find different sources for the information. You find specimens in private collections. You find specimens in major museums, the University of Arizona, um, the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, the State Collection, uh, the Flag Foundation, you know, it can be all over the place. That or you read about them in a Bureau of Mines, or even you hear about them in an old miner's tale where, or from a hunter that's been out looking and kicking rocks, and they tell you about something. Well, the Ramsey came to us totally different from those. And back when I told you about Diane Bain at the Department of Mines and Mineral Resources, telling us about the claim map that got us to the puzzler. Well, we were down researching some other properties at the department and Diane came in with a big smile on her face. And she said, have you guys got some time? You bet, what's up? She went back and came out with a report from a consulting geologist out of uh, Prescott from somewhere in the late fifties. And he had done a financial assessment of the Ramsey mine. And uh, I don't know why Diane was looking at this, but whatever. But interestingly, in the back of the report was a statement that he had discovered a spectacular occurrence of crystallized pyromorphite. And those were his words, uh, which was stunning. Um, economic geologists doing reports of feasibility of mining properties rarely get into talking about the crystals that they find. They're spending all the time talking about uh, cost per ton to get it out and what the return might be. And, and for this guy to make this comment was pretty outstanding. So we figured immediately, okay, we better, we better plan a trip to the Ramsey. And luckily on the topo map, the Ramsey was located by name. So we knew where it was at. But also when you're going out and doing reconnaissance, you know, you really need to be open to subtle signs. Because if you're, if you're uh, not paying attention, you can miss uh, the smallest of detail that will send you off down a uh, wild goose chase. We're going along I-10, a couple of miles from our exit, and we go under this underpass, and there's got to be a 10 or 12 foot long neon green sign on an overpass that says Ramsey Mine Road. I was stunned. I've driven under this overpass many, many times, going to the Red Cloud, going down to Castle Dome, the Puzzler, 
going to Disneyland. I've never noticed this sign before, but, uh, but there it was. So we ended up uh, making our turn off to the north down here in a couple of miles, looping back around and went over the uh, overpass to the mine that uh, the Federal Department of Transportation was kind enough to provide for us. And this was the head frame as we found it in 1990. It looks like it's about to fall over, but it's not. It was actually in excellent condition. And this is just the angle of the vein going down into the ground that you're seeing reflected in this structure. Um, the uh, Ramsey was similar to the puzzler in that all the workings were on the vein. The shaft went right down the vein and then the periodic uh, tunnels that went off both directions were right on the vein. Um, you can also see the ore dumps, the ore bins out there extending from the, the head frame. An interesting thing, if you go out here now, every stick of this timber is gone. I don't think it burned. There's no evidence of, uh, of charcoal, anything, any, any fire evidence. It's just clean as a whistle. There's the ore bins. Another interesting thing that I've never seen before this one had a sign on the head frame, Ramsey Mine Company. So it had its own overpass and it had a sign on it. You can't ask for anything else when you're doing reconnaissance. And uh, this first trip was the Motley crew, Dick Morris on the left, me in the center, and a jaunty Italian, George Godis, in that pink hard hat, the absolute picture of masculine security I was frustrated because I was using a timer on my point and shoot on the hood of the car and it kept going off before I could get over there and join the picture. I managed to get one in time. When we were going down the incline shaft, Dick was in front and he kept stopping and he'd, Dick and our George and I would stop and go, Hey, what, what, what's up? What are you waiting for? We had a long ways to go. And uh, he'd go, I hear something. And we'd all stop. No, we didn't hear anything. It was silent. So off we'd go again in a couple of minutes. Dick could stop again. Well, it turned out there was a ringtail cat in the shaft ahead of us. And as we'd go down, he'd go down. When we got to the first level, he disappeared off into uh, off into the workings. We didn't see him anymore. A uh, one thing I want to mention. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but the uh, the mining engineer that wrote the report said the, ex, the uh, uh, spectacular occurrence of pyromorphite was on the 450 foot level. So not only did he say what it was, but he said where it was, which was fantastic because the upper 300 feet of this mine was almost barren. We didn't even find a calcite crystal without um, that information of knowing that we needed to keep going and keep going, we never would have pushed this far down into this mine. Uh, Tony Potocek went with us on a couple of trips and Tony took a bunch of pictures of uh, some of the mining equipment and artifacts that were in here. And I don't think collectors have been in here because it was loaded. There were uh, powder boxes down here. Tony even found a picture of an Arizona mine bell sign in place. Uh, stuff that you just don't see. This one was interesting because one of the miners had uh, drawn his face on the end of the car. This is a shot Tony took of Benadonite in place in the Ramsey. So this must have been down around, you know, at least deeper than 300 feet in the vein. Uh, when we got down to the 350 level, we found an open pocket of benadonite just off the shaft. Uh, the pocket was probably, it, it was in the, the dip of the vein. It had to be 15 feet and 15 feet, I wish. It was uh, maybe 15 inches by, by 10 inches, and then it gapped open maybe four to six inches. So that was before the 450 that we were looking for. So when we came to the open pocket on 350. Dick and George both stopped there and started to dig. Well, there really wasn't room for a third. So I headed on down to the 450. And this is me digging down on the 450. You can just see my 
legs sticking up down there. Uh, you can see the ladders, which we went down into the shaft. This was the angle of the shaft, the dip. And you can see the hanging wall of the vein right here, the big slick, slick inside. The incline shaft bottomed out about 30 feet below this. This is one of the specimens that I collected on that very first day on the 450 level. Uh, it's a little less than, a, it's about an inch and a half across. Um, very nice, sharp, lustrous, greenish brown crystals with nice orange terminations, similar to puzzler material. Um, Wendell Wilson took this uh, photograph of this one and it actually ended up in what's new in minerals that year in the MR. Uh, I included this one largely to show the small brown druzy crystals at the top of the specimen. You can see the crystals again are similar. They're, the uh, vanadinites are kind of a greenish brown with those orange terminations, pretty similar to Puzzler, but that druzy brown is uh, discloisite, and we did not see any discloisite in the Puzzler. So if you see some that have the discloisite, I'd be very comfortable saying that they're Ramsey mine and not, not Puzzler. Not all Ramseys have the disclosure. Probably, you know, roughly just pulling a number out of the air, maybe 50%, something like that. But it is a distinguishing characteristic. This is a larger piece that George got later, probably three years later after that first trip. Uh, it's a little over three inches. This is in Les Presmick's collection. And those larger crystals on there are about probably a half inch. We did find a few crystals that were hoppered at the Ramsey up to, uh, up to, to pushing an inch, uh, definitely bigger than at the, uh, at the Puzzler. Okay, now we're gonna go to the last mine I'm gonna talk about, which is the Western Union in Mojave County. It's in the Serbat Mountains, just north of Kingman. And the Western Union, I have a very warm place in my heart for it. Um, we did really well at the Western Union. And I think that Western Union, the best material out of there, best Vanade Nights, I think can stand shoulder to shoulder with the best Vanade Nights from Arizona's other uh, A-list Vanade Night localities. And I'll show you some of those as we get into this. Now, Western Union, again, was one that I had never seen going through uh, collections. By this time, this was a little bit later. This was in the late 80s. Um, I, had, I had never run across one before. I, I got a call from Les Presmick, and Les had just picked up a collection of a field collector in Phoenix uh, by the name of Brad Archer. And Brad did a lot of digging with Andy Clark of the Globe Miami area in the 1970s. And they did a lot of digging up in Mojave County at the Antler Mine and also at the Western Union. And they got a couple of flats of an aid night at the Western Union, but they ended up selling them. I think Andy took them and sold them to John Metis at the Copper City Rock Shop and Globe. And they got dispersed to snowbirds and visitors that just stopped at the rock shop. So. That's why I don't think back then you saw Western Union vanadinite in local collections. At least that's my hypothesis. But there was one in Brad's collection. He had kept one. So when I went over to Les's and looked at these things, I, I saw this Western Union piece and I was really smitten by it. I loved it. It was a chunk of uh, crystalline rock, kind of a granitic rock blonde. And it had these beefy bipyramidal uh, uh, kind of uh, sandy uh, brown crystals on them. Very nice, very, very cool and different. Never seen anything like it. So anyway, I asked Les if there was any chance he was going to sell it. And nope, he was keeping it. So that meant I got a hold of Dick and said, okay, we've got another one we're going to have to go check out. So we went down to the Department of uh, Mineral Resources, Mines and Mineral Resources. They had a file on it under this name. And uh, we even got the topo map and there was the Western Union identified by name, which was pretty shocking because it's a tiny micro dot of a mine. 
So we made our trip. This was Dick and I. Uh, George didn't go on this one. Here we're looking east into the Serbat Mountains. The little, the old historic mining town of Serbat is in this valley uh, on the right. And the uh, mine is up near the, the crest of the mountains, more on the left. There's a small conical hill uh, in the foreground on the left that we'll see here in a minute. So we drove up that road as far as we could. And then we came to what appeared to be a big parking area. Well, I'm sure it was a drill platform, a, a drill pad put in probably in the 60s or 70s by a mining company exploring for uh, minerals. And this was as far as we could go. We had to hike from here. And the mine was further up on the right in that small gully up there. And this is a shot of the mine. So when I say it was small, you can see it's really little. This is a tiny little dump. And that's a cedar tree beside it on the right. And you know, cedar trees don't get very big. So this place was little. It was surprising that the USGS identified it by name, but good luck for us. So this is a shot from the mine looking back down the valley where we had just come. This conical hill on the right here was the one that I pointed out when we were down below looking up towards the mountain. The uh, range in the distance on the horizon, those are the Black Mountains and Oatman, uh, Laughlin, Bullhead City, the Colorado River are all immediately on the other side. This is the portal to the Western Union, very small, no timber. It was in competent crystalline rock. I don't think there was ever any timber that they put in here. Here's Dick checking for snakes. And this is when we got inside the portal and then you look back out towards the entrance. That's daylight out there, you're saying. And uh, the this one was different. The Western Union was different from the Puzzler or the Ramsey in that those two, the workings were driven right on the vein. The Western Union was different in that the miners had discovered the vein higher up on the hillside and it it uh, dipped down into the uh, into the mountain. They had gone below it and then driven a tunnel in and cross cut the vein at about 80 or 100 feet further in. So all of this tunnel is driven in waste rock. So when we got in and found the vein, uh, we found this old, cool, hand crank wooden windlass still sitting there, probably from the 1940s. That big white slick you can see behind it is, uh, is one of the vein structures. So this windlass is over a small shaft that went down maybe 20 feet. So there's a wooden platform that all this muck is stacked up on here. And uh, we looked in the walls up here in the vein and we found vanadinite. And I, I suspect this is where the piece came from that Brad and Andy had dug. I'm not certain of that, but we found crystals very similar to that. At the edge of the platform, you could look down into the shaft, the little wind shaft. And uh, there's a, a, a shallower level down here or a little flat area about 10 feet down and then about another 10 feet down to the bottom. So we lowered a, a rope and that's Dick going down. He's just gotten down to the first flat area. And then there's a wooden ladder over there that was there. We didn't bring it. And that ladder goes on down to the bottom. Now this, when we got down in this shaft, we looked at the walls where the vein was and there was much more of an night down here. It was just a few feet away, but but the potential down here was much greater than up above. So um, also at the very bottom where that ladder is, there was a small tunnel that went off to the left. It didn't go very far. It was maybe went in 10 feet, eight feet, something like that and stopped right on the vein. But there was vanadinite in that tunnel and the ceiling and in the face and then in the walls of the shaft. So Dick went in and started digging in the tunnel and I, took that ladder and leaned it up against the wall of the shaft just above the tunnel. And I started digging. And in no time, in about 45 minutes, 
it opened up into this. The rock began to uh, become brecciated and there was vanadinite everywhere. Um, all the surfaces of the rock breccia, you could go in and just break it loose with a screwdriver and lift the pieces out and they were all coated with vanadinite. And then in the gaps between the breccia, there would be clusters of vanadinite um, without matrix. And they were large crystals. They were very narrow, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, something like that, and but up to an inch long. And uh, they were yellow, grading to a nice uh, darker orange, kind of a brick red. I dug this in probably for another hour and pushed it in maybe another 18 inches, something like that. And it pocketed into a large void, probably the size of a good size uh, watermelon or maybe a, a, a soccer ball, something like that. And it was absolutely packed with uh, vanadinite, uh, solid intergrown pieces. There was, there was no room. Uh, you could not even, even stick a pencil into it. So then it just became an issue of collecting the pieces, trying to get them out undamaged and controlling them as they began to cascade out. So this was the following weekend. Dick and I took everything home, unwrapped it, washed it, and put it in white boxes. And this is the hit of everybody looking at it. That's Dick on the left in the white shirt, George Godis in the blue shirt, and on the right is Walker Malici. I used to work with Walker uh, in the past. He's a geologist. So they're pouring over our loot. This is a flat of the specimens. Those are um, three by four boxes. It's a standard, you know, Coors inside of a Budweiser flat. And several of those I still have in my collection. This was the prize. Um, it came right out of the center of the pocket. It's about five by five, four by five inches across, a solid intergrown mass of vanadinite that's like vanadinite on drugs. It's hoppered, this vanadinite going everywhere. Um, a wonderful piece. This is a photograph of it that Wendell Wilson took. That center crystal going up, it's hoppered again. It goes up through this area. You can measure it, but it is three inches long. This is just a superb vanadinite for any location. And I'm very proud of this one because it's now in the permanent mineral collection of the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. And if you go into their Cogden Earth um, Center down underground and you go into the mineral hall where they've got behind glass all those tall pillars, this is one of the specimens on exhibit in there. And uh, it makes me uh, very happy to see it next to those wonderful Bisbee azurites and tiger wolf nights. And there's a venade night from the Western Union that, that uh, Dick and I were responsible for getting. And this is another beauty. Um, George collected this one several years later. He and I were together. Uh, this one's in Les Bresnik's collection. Uh, it's about three and a half inches across. Those large beefy crystals on the upper left are an inch or greater. Um, this one, again, George and I had gone together and we were splitting for some reason. Normally we did every man for himself, but this day we split and I was a happy boy. Um, but we did both hit pockets. I hit a pocket in the ceiling of the tunnel that was about the size of a hardback book. I got maybe one flat out of it. And George hit this giant pocket in the wall of the shaft above where I got my original first pocket. And George's was the size of a, of a water cooler. It was enormous. Um, he filled every flat we brought. We must have filled 12 flats. You know, everything wrapped up like eggs and totally packed. Uh, those flats weighed a ton, taking them down the hill. But this was first pick out of that pocket. And it was this one and the one I showed you before and some others are why I think the Western Union is one of Arizona's best night localities. 
So this slide just shows some of the range of forms out of the Western Union. The upper right, uh, that, those are about an inch and a half. That, that specimen is about an inch and a half on each side. And those are acicular crystals. If that was white, you would think it was a flux fine serusa. The one on the left with the blue, um, that one is mine. It's about an inch and a half tall. That double terminated horizontal crystal is about an inch from tip to tip. And this one shows to me one of the amazing features of the Western Union is you get these incredible large, heavy vanadinite crystals, which are, you know, they're a lead crystal, lead chlorovanidate. They weigh a ton. And for those crystals to stay attached on the matrix is very unusual. Generally, when you get very large vanadinite crystals, they don't stay on the matrix uh, at other mines. But at the Western Union, it's the norm that they do stay on the matrix, which yields some just stunning pieces. I included the one on the right because that was one that I collected out of the ceiling of the tunnel. Very pretty, nice little reverse scepter standing up on it. Uh, the day that George got that great big uh, pocket on the last one that I showed you. Okay, so that finishes up um, my discussion of field collecting. However, I wanted to go back where I started and say that these were the localities that were the classic Arizona Benadonite localities when I first started. And I was not able to go collect these. And that actually was a blessing because that meant I had to go look for something else. And all of these localities came out, came basically came to the attention of collectors wide, very widely in the 1980s. Of course, the puzzler in the upper left, the Ramsey in the lower left, center bottom was the Western Union, but the J.C. Holmes down by Patagonia, really in the mid 1980s, the Gray Horse, that was an Andy Clark uh, find, Gary Fleck, that was um, around 1980. Uh, and then, of course, the North Toronto, home, the wonderful ones down by the Red Cloud, um, which are arguably Arizona's best Benade night. And that's hard to uh, hard to compete with those. But but Arizona is a fan, fabulous Benade night locality. And there are a lot of them out there still to be dug and still to be um, found by people. And to underline that, I'm going to give you pictures of these two. These are two little known localities that Dick and I dug. The one on the left, those yellow orange tabular benadonite crystals are about a quarter of an inch across. Um, they are from the Black Prince in the hieroglyphic mountains southwest of Lake Pleasant. The one on the right, that specimen is solid benadonite. It's about three inches top to bottom. It's got geometric crystals on the left side, and the right side, again, is a hoppered mass of uh, acicular benadonite. Uh, the Black Butte is north of Wickenburg at Constellation Highway. So with that, I am finished. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark. I'm going to, uh, there's a, oh, uh, got a question about where the red cloud mine is. Where the red cloud mine is, huh? Yes. Well, the red cloud is in the Trigo Mountains by the Colorado River north of Yuma. It would be almost a mirror image across the paved road from where the puzzler was. The puzzler was on the east side of the paved road. The red cloud is on the west, north of Martinez Lake. Okay. But there's... No Benade night at the Red Cloud. Great. Um, I'm going to just say that there, you know, put your questions out there. We've got that one and could use more. Uh, or you're just showing Mark was an excellent speaker and <laughs> he didn't have anything. To, nobody had any questions. He covered everything. Um, there we are. Um, Okay, I guess that's gonna gonna uh, wrap us up. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for for uh, coming on and and doing all this. And I'll let everybody. I'll remind. Oh, Wayne says thank you. Very beautiful. Um, uh, 
want to remind everybody that, uh, yes, we're still open uh, 10 to 3, Wednesday through Saturday through the end of May. And then June, July, and August, we will be open Fridays, those same hours. And we can always use volunteers. And I'll remind Mark that uh, we can use geology specimens too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember uh, that, Bob. Hmm? I'll remember that, Bob. Okay. <laughs> I won't. I, yeah, I'm joking, soliciting. All right. Um, I thank everybody for watching. I'll let Mark go, and uh, we will wrap this up a couple of seconds early. Uh, we've had uh, having a good time. Thank you very much for everybody for watching. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.